All right, hello again, day two. We are going to uh, continue our review that we have done last time. Um, problems with uh, work uh, with, uh, what should we call it, um, project and stuff like that, give me this week to get ready for with, with everything. I'm gonna uh, answer to all your messages on, on Teams. So uh, give me a couple of days to set my stuff up and everything's gonna be fine, okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna be back on track. And, and deal with it. So uh, if you have any messages or anything you want to talk about, send a message on Microsoft Teams. I'm going to answer it, OK? If you are not getting a reply from me, give me a couple of more days to set things up. So we, start, we, we went down to dynamic memory allocation, right, in our review. So we're gonna, I'm going to bring the, uh, the, uh, the notes up for that day. So we're going to go to, uh, where do we go? Uh, this is OK. We can go over here. So we went down to dynamic memory allocation. And uh, I brought up uh, one slide that I'm going to bring up now. That was this one. Okay. All right. So we talked about dynamic memory allocation, and we said dynamic memory allocation is uh, when uh, this is statically memory al allocated memory, not dynamic, because your the, the the memory that is being allocated for the array is within our uh, executable program, and when the program loads, it comes into memory and yada yada yada. Everything's going to be in it. The program runs. You have access to your array. And when everything is over, operating system takes the executable off memory. And because your memory is inside the executable, it will be gone. Life is beautiful. Right? And then we said, but when you are doing dynamically, dynamic uh, memory allocation, what happens is that you actually uh, you, you built the array yourself. The array is not built by the C compiler. When I say I mean C++, when I say C, right? So, so whenever I say C, you hear C++, <laughs> OK? Because they're potatoes, potatoes, right? The same thing. Anyways, uh, so, so what happens is that you're going to have uh, um, uh, uh, an array ki uh, kind of, you're going to assemble the array yourself. So what you do, you know that an array is built up of a pointer and uh, a piece of memory that the pointer is pointing to it. So you prepare the pointer, and you wait for the right time to assemble the array. That's the advantage of dynamic memory allocation. You don't have that one when you have statically allocated memory because you cannot know what is the size of an array when you are programming unless it's a specific thing. Like uh, the perfect and easy example for it is that it says write a program that asks users series of numbers and print them in reverse order. It is impossible to do with our knowledge if you are doing a regular array because you don't know how many integers that, or how many numbers the user is actually adding, right? And you got to say, I'm going to hold, like, I'm going to put a 1,000. What if it's 1,001? I'm going to put a million. What, is it, what if it's a million and a one, right? Whatever you do, there's, a, there is a, there's an answer that, that, that makes your program wrong. But when you are doing dynamic memory allocation, the, the array is not built until the program is running. And at the beginning of the program, you can ask the user, how many numbers you got? User tells you 52, you allocate 52. It says 5 million and third, third, 300,000. That's the amount that you're going to do, whatever. Okay? And right at that moment, when the new command is, the new uh, statement is executed, it requests the operating system to get that many entities. And because it's an object oriented thing, when you say five integers, the compiler knows an integer. In, in that platform is eight bytes or it's four bytes. And therefore, it's going to uh, allocate the exact same amount of memory that you want, initialize everything based on the value that you have or whatever that you have, and sets it up. So essentially, we all know what default constructors are, right? Right? So essentially, 
having integer being a class, the default constructor of five integers will be called at that moment because five integers will get created. And then the address of all those five integers that are sequentially ordered in memory back to back, the address of the beginning is passed into your pointer and you have your array. You can work with it like a regular array. Important thing is that if you do not remove that, we said we're gonna have memory leak. Remember that? We're gonna have memory leak. If we don't remove that one, we're gonna have memory leak and that memory leak will cause lots and lots of problems. So what are the things we need to uh, look for when we are actually dealing with dynamic memory allocation? Well, there are so many things. Let me just uh, pause this for a second. So, dynamic memory allocation and how to deal with it, okay? Number one, you have a, a pointer. We call it M data. When I put M underline, what does it mean? It's a member variable, right? So, which means this could be a member of a, of a, of a class, okay? It does, if, what I mean is that we are thinking object-oriented, although we can have these things are in a function, have a standalone pointer, but let's assume that this, it doesn't make any difference, but just I named it that way. Uh, and when I put type over there, it means pointer of anything, integer, double, employee, car, building, whatever pointer you have, okay? So you're saying, so when you write something like that, the M data is just created and it has some garbage value in it. Because it has some garbage value and it's pointing to somewhere that you don't know where, right? Because it's garbage, it points somewhere outside actually, probably your memory, all right? Therefore, uh, if you use it just like that, you put some value in it, or anyways, in any case, if you try to access the target of that pointer, you're gonna get a segmentation fault. Because you are telling, go to that address and put something in it. The address doesn't belong to you. You're going to someone else's house and try to break in. The compiler is not gonna let you do that. You're, that. That address doesn't belong to you. It's outside of your territory. So first mistake is to use an uninitialized and un a set pointer and try to actually use it. Well, you can't. That's number one. Are we okay with this? So, what you do is you, uh, uh, by standard, to make sure we do not shoot ourselves in the foot, there are a series of rules that we have to follow in dynamic memory allocation. The reason that I'm pausing on this as it's first half of the semester, I want to refresh your memory on this, make sure everybody understands it before we go on, because this is the part that you're gonna make lots of boo-boos. And if you follow these rules, you will not. Any pointer you create for now, religiously set it to null. When I say null, it means null PTR, which essentially means nowhere. So you are essentially marking it that it's pointing to nowhere. And it's a standard. So any pointer you create, you set it to null to make sure that it's recognizable to be empty. If it's garbage in it, it's a value. When it's a value, you don't know if it's a valid address or it's garbage. It's a number. To make sure you set a pointer to be unusable, you set it to null. So that's the most important thing. So you make sure that you set that one to null. Obviously, if you actually try to use a null pointer, then you're going to get a null pointer assignment. So the point, it's not going to be segmentation fault. It's going to throw a, a null pointer assignment exception. So you're going to see that uh, the pointer was empty and you try to use it. It gives you an error. So that's another boo-boo. Still, you can't use it because it's null. The next thing is to actually create the thing. So I have m data is equal to new type, m size. I have certain size created, so, and, I, and I allocate the memory. And when I am staying within the size, I have the memory, and I can work with it, and life is beautiful. As soon as you set your foot outside of that boundary, then you're in, a, in someone else's address and you're going to get a segmentation fault. So make sure you stand within the size. If you are within the size, you're good to go. If you're not, 
you're going to make a boo-boo. That's why M size is a very, very important attribute to have in your classes, to know what is the size of a dynamic memory allocation. And you have to always update it to the most recent size of the memory so you always know what is the size of the memory and you're not going out of it. Are we good with this down to this point? Are we okay one? Yeah, but, but I'll show you the but I'll, I'll show you the uh, the coding for it. But remember, when we have a class. We have an attribute, two attributes in this case. One is the data, which is the pointer that does point to our data. The other one is how many of those data I actually have reserved. So if you have twenty, you set that one to twenty. But the consequences of the program dictates that you have to resize that to twenty-five because user needs more. So when you reallocate, you have to make sure you update the M size to be 25 so you know what your limits are. It means your M size must always be recent. Yes? Never, ever, ever, never you use size off. Ever, never. I'll tell you why. The reason that I went that dramatic, just to make sure that when you see something, some command, it looks like what it is, OK? It looks like you know what is it doing. But let me show you something. So Mr. Sizeoff, integer pointer PTR, right, is equal to new int. What is the size of the array now, PTR? 4,000, right? How come it's 8 now? Size off gives you the size of the target. PTR is a pointer, is a variable, right? Pointer, again, I always, if you were my IPC student, you know when we did pointers, what do I say about pointers? Don't get scared. Pointers are just variables. They hold, there are integers that are holding addresses, right? That integer is eight bytes because it wants to hold the thing. So you are holding this, you are checking the size of the, the pointer. You are telling me what is the size of the pointer. It's an eight bytes thingy, right? Size of always gives you and, and it, it's in bytes, not number of integers. <laughs> right? So size of is a C command. It's not C++. Out of your head until you know what is it doing. Okay? Thank you for the question. It was a very good one, actually. We understand what size of is, right? All right, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to actually save this thing as do not use size off dot cpp. <laughs> okay, so that's the, that's the first note that we put over there. Okay, just remember that when you look at it, you'll see what's going on. But please keep questions, keep these top of questions coming, okay? So, we were down to here. Now, the next thing we need to do, we need to understand is that when you are resizing your memory, if you have a pointer pointing to some kind of data, you set that one to a new site, new piece of memory, that's the biggest concern for us at all times. When you have a a pointer, you have to always delete the pointer before you reallocate memory in it. Always, always, always. If you follow the first rule that I told you, which means an unused pointer is set to null, then deleting a null pointer will not do anything. Because inside the delete mechanism, it is set that if it's null, ignore it. If it's not null, it deletes it. Such a thing will cause memory, memory leak. So if you have a pointer pointing to a piece of memory, 
before you want to reuse that to resize, to set to new memory, whatever, you have to delete the old one. Okay? Remember that. You have to delete the old one. That causes memory leak. Right? Because when you set it to a new value, the old value, and there is no way to find that address anymore. Yes? I'll show you a slide for resizing. We'll go through it. Thank you for the question. We'll come to that. OK, so correct state of unused pointer is always null, and you set the size to 0, so you know what it is. The correct state of dynamic memory allocation is as follows. It's exactly the number of the things that you have and everything. And you always delete the way you created your memory. If you create it with square brackets, which means you're telling that this pointer is an array, not an individual thing. If you put square brackets when you are doing new, you are saying, OK, so so this, is, this PTR is now int. When I delete it, I need to go delete PTR because I created it using square brackets. If I say over here integer pointer p is set to int, now the delete, oh, sorry, sorry, new int. Now the delete does not need square brackets because it's a single entity. This means delete them all. This means delete one. That's one of the reasons that you have memory leak. You create like an array. You delete without square brackets. Therefore, it deletes only the first element. The rest remains in memory. OK, you got to remember. <laughs> I want to pose. Anyway, so are we good? And I think I made a boo-boo, didn't I? Is it pausing or is it paused or it's actually recording? I think it's recording, is it? Yeah, it's recording. Phew, I thought it's not recording. All right. And after you delete, you always set to null. Again, religiously do it at the moment. At the moment right now, be obsessive. You delete, you set to null after. Until you are knowledgeable enough to know when you don't need to set it to null. This makes it safe for now. For now, we are rookies. You delete, you set to null after. OK? Until we know. So you might do the set to null after and get me a message when I'm reviewing your code. Sets, get me a message saying that you didn't need to set it to null because whatever, OK? Just understand that and don't feel bad because you are trying to make sure you are covering all your bases. So for now, when we are rookies, you delete, you set to null after to make sure it is recognized that this thing is deleted, OK? If you do not delete properly, Again, the first one's going to get deleted, and the rest will be memory leak. You have to always delete how you create, OK? So because of following the rule, you can always check to see if the data actually points to something. If it's not null PTL, you can take care of unfinished business. It is recognizable, and then you can do whatever you are doing, OK? You don't need to check to see if it's null for to free. When you free, you just delete, because delete by itself checks to see if it's null or not. You don't need to. But if you have some unfinished business, you want to print the values before you delete them, or something like that, you can make sure if it's not null, first take care of unfinished business, and then go through, go about your work. Uh, yeah, and then you reuse your memory. Always stay uh, within the size of uh, the values that you have, and you're good to go. So that was about uh, memory allocation. How do we resize memory? Okay, How do we resize memory? Again, there is a specific type of uh, rule and setting that you go through when you are uh, resizing memory that is very straightforward. So 
to resize memory, obviously you already have the pointer pointing to a piece of memory that has some information in it, right? Now you have seven, user wants more, okay? If that's the case, what you do, first you create a temporary pointer of the same type, not to lose the old one, and then you allocate the new, um, the new size that you want, either smaller or bigger. Maybe you want to shrink the memory. Anyways, you want to resize. It doesn't have to be bigger. It could be smaller. It doesn't make any difference. So, oh, there's a screen over here too. All right. All right. So, <laughs> I'm like, what, what is she looking at? All right. All right. So, okay. So, so you do that. So, you actually uh, uh, get the size that you want in the temporary one. After doing that, you copy all the old information from the old memory into the new one. Obviously, when you shrink, you only copy the first ones, and the rest you ignore because you are shrinking the memory. If you are increasing, then you copy everything. So therefore, after you do that, you have all the information in the old one in the new one. Now that's the case, you can get rid of the old one. So the old one gets wiped out. After the old one is wiped out, you don't care anymore because it's deleted. Now your M data is ready for you to get the address of the newly allocated memory, which is temp, right? But obviously, before doing that, you have to make sure you update the size to 14 because now your size is 14, not 7 anymore. Always keep it recent. And then after that, what you do, you get the address that is inside temp, and you put that address, that address in M data. Therefore, M data and temp point to the same place now. And after everything is done, because usually these things all happen in a separate function, in a, in a separate scope, right? That temp is a local variable. It's, it's going to vanish. Therefore, you're going to have uh, Informa new information coming, and here comes the question. Uh, yes, sir. Is this going to be uploaded to like uh, your? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Uh, every single slide that you see is going to go into notes right beside the notes that you have for that day. Everything's going to be there, okay? All the slides are going to be there. Are we okay with this? Questions? Suggestions? Objections, yes. Indestructor? For now, well, because I said religiously do it, but no, you don't need to. It's like, destructor is like a disposable dish. You eat in it, you don't want to wash it, right? You just throw it in garbage. It's something like that. So uh, the question was that I do not need to set the pointer to null in a destructor. The answer is no, you don't need to, because the object is about to get destroyed. Who cares if it's null or not, right? But for now, not to get confused which one is what, if you don't know, set everything to null at any time. If you know it, please don't. I'll be happy to see that you didn't do it. Yes. This was the most beautiful question I've ever heard in my life, okay? So I got goosebumps, and you got 2% for your final, okay? So, so yes, when you delete an object, the object is destroyed. When an object is destroyed, what is to be called? Destructor. When you create an object, so when you create an array of 1,000 employees, 1,000 default constructors will be called for those employees. Got it? Yeah, all right. What? Yeah, let's say it that way. Yeah. Int is a primitive type. It doesn't have a destructor. But if it was not a primitive type, yes, it would. Yeah, something similar. Are we good down to this point? So in here, I'm going to say, uh, actually, let's rename it properly. So this one is A. And you see over here is x64. That's why the pointer was 8. If I made that 
debugging 32-bit, then the pointer would have been 4. Okay, just letting you know. When you have a 64-bit platform, when I say platform, it's a combination of CPU, compiler, and operating system. <laughs> Actually, CPU, operating system, and compiler, okay? When you do a 64, you're actually telling the compiler to make it 64 thingy. Okay, so that's that. And the other one is proper deleting. All right. So are we good down to this point? Questions? Yes, is that a question or you're just stretching your fingers? Okay. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Good, 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 good. So, I know I'm stretching it a bit too long, but we know so when uh, an object is assigned to another object, what is being called? You said it almost right. So, what is it called? Operator assignment, right? So assignment operator is being called, correct? Assignment operator is the only operator that you cannot overload it as a helper. Assignment operator must be a member. You cannot have an assignment operator. You plus operator, you can have it as member. As a matter of fact, every single operator you overload, you must make it a member unless you can't, okay? Never use helpers. Helpers are against object orientation. We came to the conclusion that methods, functions, need to have owners, otherwise they're scary, right? So only and only use helper functions when you have no other way, or you've been instructed to do so in a test to see if you can do it or not. Yes? Yeah. So what I'm saying, what I said was literal, and it is possible. There is no way that you, helper functions can all be, uh, helper operators can all, they can all be members of a class if you have access to the code of the class, or they are not primitive. So if you have integer at left side, obviously it has to be a member. It has to be a helper because it cannot be member of integer, <laughs> right? Integer is not a class. Or if you want to overload something to print for with C out and C in, you don't have access to iStream's class definition. You cannot go change the iStream class. It's at left side. You want to print it, right? Then it can't be a member. So again, if possible, if not possible, use helper. Otherwise, other than that, always use member variables. Okay? Do not use helpers. They are not good for your health. What are friends for? Knife in the back, remember. Friends, knife in the back. You never use friend unless you need to. Friends are ownership. Okay? A friend of something is its owner. So don't use friends unless you have to. We have no friendship in an object. There is a very cruel, cruel world, okay? No friends. You're all alone. Anyways, so that's that. An, an automatic object gets deleted automatically. So. Obviously, this is ME. So we have an employee, right? Right? And we have some kind of a constructor over here. I don't want to. I don't want to code it right now. Employee, whatever. Okay. And so that's 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 the thing we have. So in here, if I say employee E, when the scope is over. We don't need that thing, that's distraction. Now, when main is over, E will die because it's an automatic variable. 
employee in here is an automatic variable. Therefore, it will die when the scope is over. You're okay with that? Now, you're okay. kind of okay with that, right? There is no stupid, if, if you knew everything, you wouldn't be a student here, would you? Go. Return zero and close curly bracket are identical. That's why you should never have more than one return statement in a function. If I see that, you get a big boo-boo from me, boo-boo message from me. OK? Never, ever have more than one return statement in a function. It means you're lazy because you didn't want to write an if statement. Never more than one return statement in a function. OK? A function must have one point of entry and one point of return. That's why whenever you see return, it's actually a go to the end. All right? One more time. Do the reverse. If you have one condition that does nothing, it means it's else is doing something, right? <laughs> so reverse the condition, then you have a something. <laughs> then you have a condition that does something, right? All right. Yes. Lazy, lazy, lazy. That's being lazy. Never, ever use more than one return statement in a function. You are essentially going 40 years back. Anybody knows what is the command go to? We have a go to statement in C that you can go to on a statement. Nobody uses it ever. Why? Because it was abandoned 40 years ago. Now, now, I mean, like when, when, when C programming language came about and structure language came over here, say, don't do go to's because it's bad. That's the time that you wrote three return statements in a function. A return statement is a go-to to the end of the function, not good. It's exactly like continue. You should never use the key, the statement continue. If I see that, it's automatic rejection of your thing. Never use continue. Never use break unless you're in a, in a switch statement. You are never allowed to use a break in a for loop because unconditionally you are getting out of the loop you have another go-to. A continue is a go-to to the beginning of the loop. A break is a go-to to the end of the loop. They are just fancy go-tos. Do not use them, OK? We are off that. Let's not go back to you know, stone ages of programming, OK? Please. Yes, I, I see you're laughing. I know you're using it everywhere, aren't you? <laughs> you're like, <laughs> I used it before. Yes. Uh, did I mention to use your opera voice in the class? No. Use your opera voice in the class. Don't, because I would understand what you're saying. Okay. All right. You were saying? There, are, there is nothing but types but in like C++. You mentioned that some, like, there are also objects. Yeah, object, object is an instance of a type. When oh, you say type. integer A, integer is the type. Oh, okay. A is the object. I was oh, okay. class, so. Yeah, okay. So objects are essentially instances of a class, uh, of, a, of a type. When you create a type, any class is a type. So when I say class, structure, primitive type, they are all types. Okay? Employee is a type. It's an automatic type. It's going to type at, die at the end. And we're going to have this now. That employee is not going to die at the end. The destructor will not be called because it's not automatic. It's manual. I created it. I have to kill it. This program now has a memory leak. OK? For me to make this go away, I do whatever I need to do with employee. Use the employee. Use the, the target of p and and then after that you're going to say delete p 
Obviously, because I didn't use the square bracket, I'm going to delete it as, as such. Not automatic is automatic. Yes? Uh, I'm a bit confused when you talk about the return statements. Like, in some cases, we have to return, like, this, this certain data type or a null point. Then we have to use if else statements and Impossible. Huh? Use a reference, use a pointer. Use, there is, is it, it is any code that you have that you think you can't, you show me it's in its three seconds. Like, uh, we could use a ternary as well, uh, right? But, uh, like one return Just return. Like put a variable for your value. Set the value to whatever variable to whatever value you want and return that one. Uh, you want us to set the value to null first and then allocate? Yes, that's what you do. When, so I have a, I want to, for example, I want, I have a function called clone that is supposed to get a, make a clone of myself and return it. Let's say this, this employee has a clone thingy, right? So let's say the employee over here has a function called clone. So employee, employee, pointer, clone, right? And it's supposed to make a clone of itself based on certain condition. And sometimes it cannot clone itself. There I have, therefore, I have to return null, right? So what I do, I'm going to say employee C a pointer CL is null PTR if whatever, whatever, then CL is new employee copy from my, from me, and then I'll return it. Done. Why do I need two return statements? Impossible. Like, let's say uh, if this condition is true, I return true or false. I can do it in one ternary statement. Yeah, sure, you can do it. If you can do it, if it's one ternary statement, then it's one return statement. Yeah, it's then it's fine. fine. Sure, of course. As long as I see one return and it's at the end, you're fine. You cannot have a return in the halfway through the thing. By the way, you cannot have a void function and have one return statement halfway through. That's two return statements. Yes. That's not going to work. No, that's not going to work. No, 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 no. This is, this is assuming, because I did not put anything in here, uh, no, no copy constructor, the compiler is going to create it for me, right? OK. Uh, I am talking, assuming that you all know what copy construction is, copy assignment is, and everything. Are we good down to this point? Again, this week is review. Don't worry, next week I'm going to accelerate twice as fast, OK? You have a question? No. You want a quiz? You, I can give you a quiz. You want a quiz? I told you, this week I've got to do all. Uh, assume that you have a quiz that day. If, did I teach anything? No. So why do I want to? Give me a second. I'll give you. I know. I know. I'm. I'm, I'm if there is a quiz, you're going to get one, OK? And you should always assume that you have a quiz in the lab, all right? And if we don't, then be happy and just listen to the lecture or do your lab. Yes? I have to update it. Again, give me, give me till the end of the week to set it up. I'll set your uh, uh, workshops to be due on Monday or something, because this is your lab. So assuming you need three days after the lab, something like that, right? So this is Thursday, right? Friday, Saturday, Sunday, probably Monday. So I'll set it like that. Three days for your. Yeah, I'll set it up. Yes. And the next one's going to be due next Monday, and next Monday, and next Monday. I'll set it like that. Because all my labs are today and tomorrow. So when you, you're talking about part one or both, part one and about reflection is just a reflection. No, no, because OK, the, I'll do the reflection four days after that. No, no. Yes. <laughs> because on the submitter, it was different. Like, it was Wednesday. Just dash do. When, give me two days, end of this week. Then do dash do. It tells you when it's due. Okay. Okay. Can we submit the group together? Like, yeah, but, but do your reflection when you did something in a project. Because your reflection force 
for workshop is for project two. For project two, right? That's why you only have a reflection a few days after. You don't have a DIY anymore. Right? Remember, the reflections you are doing now are reflections on work. <laughs> reflections now are reflections. Huh? <laughs> I can't whistle, believe me. I just didn't do it out of respect. <laughs> I can go break the windows now, but <laughs> I didn't do it on purpose. So, and still he's talking. <laughs> Should I whistle? I'm going to bring a water gun next time. <laughs> Okay, or BB gun, no, BB gun's harsh. Anyway, so, <laughs> okay, so, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, 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 so reflects are reflections on the workshop and whatever you have done in the project down to this dot point, okay? All right, so, what am I gonna do next? Copy constructions and assignment and all the good stuff we have. So when, and I want your attention here now. I don't know if you have, did, it, did they use, no, they didn't use my slides. They, did, you didn't see these slides before, right? So I have two classes, class A, class B, and two people that keep talking with each other. I'm going to move you guys. Shush. Okay. So, so we have class A, class B, and there are, they have some properties. Uh, as you see, you have dynamic memory, and they have some size over there, right? Are we okay with this? Now, let's see what is bad assignment. When I just set this one to another, okay, when I just set one to another, compiler only knows of the existence of the scope of the class, therefore copies everything from one class to another overriding the class with the data of the other one. And as soon as it does that, it appears that it's got copied because they are both pointing to the same pointer and you have a memory leak, you don't see that. So when you do all your printouts and everything looks beautiful, but the ad, and at the end of your program, you get a segmentation fault. So whenever your program is exiting and you have a segmentation fault, that's the reason. Because when everything is over and it wants to destroy, the first destructor destroys the memory, right? And the second destructor wants to destroy and it crashes. And that's when it dies. Okay? So keep that in mind. That's bad assignment. We do not want to have bad assignment. Whenever you have dynamic, whenever you have classes with resources out of their scope, you need to handle those things for assignment and copying. So in OOP244, we have rule of three. What are the rule of three? Rule of three? Uh, and? Uh, and? We did that assignment. So rule of three, copy assignment. Copy constructor and destructor. Rule of three in OOP244. When you go OOP345, it becomes rule of five. Okay? But because we have move assignment and move, co move copying too, so you're going to see what is that. Pretty cool stuff when it comes to you. Go, so, wow, this is nice. So, 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 yeah, so rule of three. Remember, rule of three, extremely important for us to know. Rule of three. So, this was one of the rule of three that was not actually. Uh, followed. And the same thing for copying. When you actually do copying, you, this is the problem. So for bad copying, you have uh, uh, a class and you have a second class that you do assignment at the moment of creation or you copy it. Assignment at the moment of creation is a call to copy constructor, not assignment operator. Assignment operator at the moment of creation is copy constructor. It's not assignment. Remember that. Very important fact to go through. So exactly the same thing is happening. So as soon as it copies, there is no memory leak over here. But the data is shared unintentionally. Therefore, when you actually do this, they both look at the same thing. The destructor of one goes away, and the other one is going to create uh, 
the crash. Are we okay with this? Should I show it again? Or it was too fast? So, uh, what did I do? Okay, let me go to the beginning. Yeah, so, there you go. So, what happens is that, oh, it's, oh, no, never mind. I thought uh, the class has ended, but it's not. OK. So <clears throat> uh, when copying happens, one class is created using the data of another class. Because copy constructor is not created, it copies the content only. Therefore, they're shared at the, the resources outside of their scope. When one is deleted, the other one wipes out, and bad copying causes memory leak, and a destructor clash happens. And Bad copying happens because of passing arguments by value 2, which means I have a class A, as you see, with a value, and then I have a function that calls, and that is called passing that class by value. When you pass a class by value, the value you are passing becomes an assignment for the argument. So that's how functions are called in C. In C, when you call a function, the value you are passing initializes the arguments of the function. So behind the scene, that's what happens. Therefore, B is getting copied out of A. Therefore, copy constructor is called. And when copy constructor is all called, the B inside foo becomes a, a copy of a, but it's sharing the same value. And when foo goes out of scope, B dies, takes out with it the data that belong to A. And therefore, when A goes away, that's a destructor crash. When you, this one was passing by value. First one was initializing. First one it was initializing. But passing an argument by value is the same as initializing. When you pass, any time you call a function of any type, ladies and gentlemen, it is extremely important to understand this fact. Any time you are calling a function, so if I have over here a function called, uh, say, um, set ID, set ID, okay? And in here I have integer A, and in here I'm saying M employee number is equal to A. Are we okay with this? I am setting, now in here, if I say e dot set id to 1000, what happens behind the scene is this, e dot set id int a is equal to 1000. That's what happens when you call the function. It calls the function setting the argument to the value that is coming in. Because of this fact, that the argument is initialized by the value passed. When you pass an object by value, behind the scene, the copy constructor gets called. Because I called, I created a class, I passed the class by value to a function. Because it's passed by value to the function, the B up there actually gets initialized by A, therefore, copy constructor is called. OK? Returning objects by value. How does C language return a value in a function? I have to tell you something that is extremely, it, it turns me off like crazy. I go. Bananas, I lose my concentration. When I talk, I see two people are talking. Please don't do that, OK? If you have a question in your mind, address it to me, not to your friend. I really appreciate if you did that, OK? Because it, I don't know, for some reason, it's, a, it's, a, it's completely turning me off, OK? I mean, the brain goes, boo! So please, 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 I beg you, do not talk when I'm talking, all right? So. 
how a function returns a value. Okay? When you have a variable inside the function that is being returned, so when I have a function, any type of function, when I have a function, any type of function, it doesn't have to be a member function, any function, if I have something like integer uh, get int, and in here I have integer value, and I have C in value and returning value. All right? And I just mentioned two seconds ago, please don't talk when I'm talking. All right. Silence! All right. Now, when I return a value inside a function, what happens? The value over here is created inside get int, correct? Therefore, what type of a variable it is? Value is what type of a variable it is? No, 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 value, line 20. It's an automatic variable, correct? Remember I told, you told me that this structure is called when it goes out of scope? Remember that? Value is one of those. That integer will die when get int is done, correct? So how can it return it? Yes, no, but value is dead. Value goes out of scope when get int is done. How come it returns the value? Makes a copy out of it. If it did not make a copy, it was not able to return it because value dies. So a nameless copy, a nameless integer copy of value is returned. That's how you get the value. Because of that fact, when you are returning an object by value, without knowing, a copy constructor is called. So you have a class, data class, yada, yada, whatever, and then you return that. And as you see, foo is returning the data class by value. And in here, I'm saying b, 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 b is set to foo. Therefore, foo is returning a, and b will be set to it, correct? foo to return a creates a temporary nameless object out of it. That temporary nameless object gets returned into b. And that is a copy of a. Therefore, this nameless object that is getting created shares the value with the size, with the a. Sorry, with the a. And because of that, because this is a nameless, at, at this line, as soon as that nameless is use is done, it dies. It doesn't keep nameless objects. C++ doesn't do it. As long as the assignment is done and all the good stuff is done, at this line, that nameless object dies and takes out with it the size. Why did I dis destroy A? It's wrong. Nameless dies, not A. But anyways, or the other way. Yeah, nameless dies. You're right. Sorry, sorry. Nameless dies. First nameless dies. Uh, first A dies over here. And when A dies, I, it tries to kill the nameless. But nameless is pointing at that memory that is already dead. Therefore, uh, it's going to have a crash. OK? That's why when you are returning something, you are doing copy constructors. So how do we do good copying? The good copying happens as follows which essentially, <coughs> what you do, you get the size of the, the original one, you create exact amount of memory as you want for the other one, you copy everything from the old one to the new one, and you update the size, and good copying is done. That's copy constructor, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, and then because of this, when the first one dies and the second one dies, life is beautiful and nothing goes wrong. Are we okay with that? Yeah. And the exact same thing happens with the assignment. So when you have assignment, same thing happens actually for it. You have two different ones, but the difference between assignment and copy construction is that copy construction constructs something out of Nothing, which means you don't have an already existing memory. But in assignment, you already have something. 
right? So you got to make sure that before you do anything, if, when the assignment happens, you destroy the data of the other one. Otherwise, you're going to have a memory leak. That is the only difference between copy assignment and copy constructor. That's why copy assignment is reused always in copy constructor. If in copy constructor you set the, if in copy constructor you set, you follow the rule that I told you and set the data to null, the delete won't do anything. Because deleting null won't do anything. That's the only thing that is different. As soon as you delete it, the rest is exactly the same, no difference. And the structure goes, and life is beautiful. Because primitive types, they don't have any resources outside of their territory. See, a primitive type is you coming with nothing in your hand. When you go out of the room, everything is beautiful, correct? An object with resources is you with your backpack. If you go out of the room, backpack will be leaked in here. You have to take your backpack with you. It's a resource out of you. A primitive value contains its data within. You take it, it's exactly like non-dynamic memory allocation. When the executable is gone, the data goes with it because there is nothing outside. Correct? It's the same thing. Got it? All right. Shallow copying, deep copying, sure. That's just fancy names for it. Deep copy means, ooh, I'm going to copy the resources. Yeah. Shallow copying, it means only the content will be copied. Right. So, so, the, so the value that we're returning, that is the shallow. But right after that, and therefore, you're, you're deallocating the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. You were, you were, so what, what happens is that, yeah, because you didn't do have a copy constructor, the two objects share the same piece of memory. When one deletes it, the second one goes once to delete it. They're in trouble. There is nothing to delete. All right, so that was dynamic memory allocation to the bone. And I had to go through it. It was very important to, to talk about it. Uh, we have till 9.45. Nine, 45, right? Okay. Anybody wants break? Huh? If you want to say, don't say no, say yes. Yes, you want to break? Okay, break. Okay, five minutes, please. And please, please, an important thing that you didn't see last time, because I brought this monster thing with me now. It's my device, so you have to. All right, it was brought up to me some syntax that you didn't know what they are. Let me explain what it is. So. Uh, what did I do over here? So here we talked about, I'm just going to write over here, C pointers and stuff. So please take a look at this, ladies and gents. Please take a look at this. There is a universal way of setting stuff in C++ now, okay? Initialization. Let's say I have an integer and I want to set that integer, initialize that integer to the value three. I can do this, integer i three. It sets that integer to three. Let's say I have an integer, and I want to default that integer to its default value. A default value for an integer is zero. I can say integer b, it sets it to zero. Let's say I have 9,000 integers and I want to set them all to null. I can go, or double, double d 9,000, and I just do this. They are all defaulted. Let's say I have an employee and I want the employee to be defaulted, okay? What do I do? I'll go employee, E, 
and I do this. So essentially, th let me just bring that employee from the other one in here so it actually gives, doesn't give me an error. So I have the employee over here, so I'm just going to copy. All right, this is the same thing as saying employee All right, but that's universal. You can use it for anything. You want to make a pointer null, integer, pointer, curly bracket. That means it's null. So empty curly brackets in front of something sets it to its value. If you put something inside the curly bracket, it will automatically passes it through. So if I want six integers and I want the first three to be set, I can go or say um, float. So I'm going to go float f5, and I can do over here 1.1, 2.2, and 3.3. .3. Now the first three are set and the rest are nullified. You don't need an assignment in front of them anymore. You could put an assignment if you like to. It works. It doesn't make any difference. This is a universal way of initialization in C++. Yes. Opera voice. One more time. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. And if I do this, just to show you why is it uh, universal, I may have something like this in here. I may have employee const character pointer name. Right? That sets the name of the employee, correct? So now in here, I can actually do this. I can say employee x. Do you hear that the thing? Yeah. All right. Yes. <laughs> Instead of equal to nine pointer, you can say equal to curly bracket null pointer, or just put curly bracket null pointer, or just put curly bracket. Yeah, does the magic. So those curly brackets, like if you don't put anything in it, so these are all the same. So I could do this. Q is equal to. But which one you would do? <laughs> I would use the first one. Why do I run so much gibberish? They're all the same, right? So I just put that one and be done with it. Magic. OK? I will see one Huh? I will see one to use this one. I want to know what is the relationship between the two. So then which one be like this is calling your constructor. No, no, this no, is a universal no, no. way of using constructors. No, Kill me now. Please be quiet. Do not talk in class. That mumbling over there really is distracting to me. Please. One more time. In the workshop, initialize data members, but you can also do that in constructor instead of it inside. No, you don't do it in constructor. I'll explain later why. Try to always initialize your member variables rather than doing it in a constructor. Because then it's going to be done in any constructor. If you do it in a constructor, you have to do it in every single constructor. But when you do it in a member, in a, in a, the member side, everything is going to get set. Okay. So initialize. So if I am, if I want the employee, so what what I will do is this. That's like immediately I do that. I don't even think because I want my class to get created fresh and empty in any case. I don't need to go in a default constructor set to something and go that one to set to something. Especially in dynamic memory allocation, that's 
a lifesaver. Okay? So let's actually do it like this. So let's say this is actually a dynamic thing. I would always do that. Always. All right? Yes. Good. And hopefully it's going to be the last time thinking about it. Yes. Garbage. So you don't know what it is. From compiler to compiler is different. One compiler by default does that. Initializes it to zero. Another compiler might not. You don't want to take chances. Never leave anything to default because that's the source of bugs in different types of compilers. And I'm seeing it every day in high-level stuff. No, do this always. Never leave it to default. This is leaving it to default. Leaving it, when I say to default, it means what the language does by default, what the compiler. Some compilers may set these to null. Then you're happy. And some compilers may don't. Then you have trouble. So you see your program works perfectly on Linux, but doesn't work on Mac. Or works on Mac, doesn't work on Ubuntu. Works on Ubuntu, doesn't work on AS400. So you don't want that. You want it to work everywhere. Never leave anything for the compiler to decide. Do it yourself. So if there is any change in the compiler in future, then you're good. Yes. Set empty function is for after the fact. Set empty function is to set a, a, a class to empty after things are done. This is for just at the beginning. Set, you can, at any time you can set the thing to empty. Empty is, again, set empty is a tricky thing. Set empty or set to invalid empty state. There are two different things. Set empty is to set something to empty. Not necessarily invalid, like you have a mug, class mug, you have set empty, I want my mug to be empty, no coffee in it. Set invalid empty, set this mug to an unusable mug. So you, you know that I cannot use this before I do something. So again, be careful with that set empty thingy. Set empty thing can be used in two different ways. Empty your object or flag your object to be unusable, recognizable, unusable state. Okay? You always clarify that with your prof, with your uh, team lead, whoever is dictating you to write, and what is the set empty? Am I setting it to that or this? So you know which one it is. Yes? Just to clarify, if we have the universal initial You just, oh, so if I, so because my default constructor is supposed to set everything to empty, is that what you're saying? So you can do this then. Because the default constructor doesn't need to be implemented, you can just do this. And don't write it. So it's as if you created an empty destruct constructor. Because it's already doing it, your default constructor doesn't need to do anything, right? But you cannot not define it because you're defining other constructors. So you want to tell to the compiler, hey, create this even though I'm not. So that default just does it. This one you're talking about? I didn't get that. One more time. Oh, yeah, can just leave it because it's empty. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. So you do this, it saves you lots of time in other things, all the other different. So you ha yeah, that makes your life easy, yeah. So you're, you have a clean thing to work with. You don't have to keep thinking about it every five seconds. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. That's, it. that's one of the first things that you need to know about classes. These. It wasn't like that a few years ago. It's a new thing. When I say new thing in C++, that means 10 years, right? Five years, 10 years. <laughs> okay. <coughs> All right. So that's that. Now we know that. 
I don't need to talk about member functions. Hopefully you know. Constructions we know. Uh, current object. It's an, this the address of the current object. When you do target of, it becomes the object itself. Member operators always have to be member. We don't have non-member operators unless we have to. So for example, in here, for this employee, if for some, let's say employee has a salary too. Okay, if I want to have an operator to add to the value of the salary. So when I have a double value I want to add to it, I never make it a member. I'm going to write over here first, and, and I'm going to always over here say employee reference operator plus equal uh, double value. And then in here I'm going to say salary. Oh, 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 I'm a bad person. I'm a bad, bad person. M salary. M salary plus equal value. Of, or let's say, and I want to have some condition over here, if value is greater than zero. So we have a reason to do it, right? So otherwise, why do I want to add anything to it? All right, so something like that. And in here, I'm going to say return this. So this is perfectly legit thing to do. You never make this as a helper. But what if I want to get the value of an employee, salary of an employee, and add it to a double? So what if I, in my code, I have something like this. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. So in here, I'm going to say, CD Okay, so so now in here, let's say I have an employee. And I want to have something like double uh, uh, budget, or I'm going to say money over here, and it has some value in it. Now I want to say, for example, a to and, and double total. And I want to say total is equal to money plus the, the salary of employee. If I want to do that, now at left side, I have a double. Because it's a double, that plus cannot be a member of money. So I have to have a helper function. Got it? So what I will do over here, I'm going to have a helper function. So in here, I'm going to create a helper function. So it's going to be double uh, operator plus. And in here, I'm going to have a constant employee reference, um, E. And in here, uh, and in here, I'm going to say integer uh, value, uh, sorry, double value, and return that value, whatever it is, right? So now I need to access the, va the, the, the employee's uh, uh, salary. Horrible way of doing it is this. Again, I see this, your assignment is rejected, and I'm going to come with you with a baseball bat. Okay? So don't do this. That's horrible way of doing it. So you can actually say, uh, what did I do in here? I'm sorry. Uh, 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 double left argument. So, yeah, I can actually do it. I don't need a double. So in here, I'm going to say left argument arf. Somebody help me so I can type. It's been a while. OK. <laughs> argument left argument plus equal e dot salary. M salary, thank you. And return left argument. Obviously, it's not going to allow me because I changed the signature. I'm going to get the signature and put it over here. That's a horrible way of doing it. 
because I gave the key of my house to some stranger. They can go over here and change, change the name. They can change the idea of the employee in here. I should not allow to do that. For that, what I will do is this. I will create a getter function over here, and I'm going to make it strict. So I'm going to say I have a, const, uh, a, a double salary, and it's going to receive it. And it's a constant thing that cannot change me in any way. Now return the salary. So this salary with supervision returns the salary of an employee, not allowing to change the employee anyway because it's a constant method. It cannot change the owner. Now I can actually come over here and in peace remove this awful, ugly thing. And in here I can say e dot salary. And I can call that salary even if the object is constant because my method is constant. That's when you have a helper function. Never. Or if I want to print. If I want to print it with C out, I don't have access to C out. Therefore, it's got to be a helper function. Yes? Special what? You're talking about this one? There's nothing special with that. It's just <laughs> it just makes this. Uh, function read only. You cannot change anything of the class in this function. Yeah. Can you tell again why helper function is a member of the left? The, because a member function needs the left one to be the owner. In here, I can say, if I want, I can say E plus equal $2,000. I gave $2,000 raise to this employee. Because at left side, I have the employee, the, the, this one is a member of it. So the, the functional way of calling this is to say e dot operator plus equal 2,000. These are both valid calls. I can use them both. Either use the function name or operator name. They both work. Right? How can I make this dot beside money? Do you have access to class of double to make this a member of double? Can I say money dot operator? No. Money is a double. Double is a primitive value. It cannot have a member variable, therefore helper. Got it? You don't look satisfied in your face. It's like, oh, OK, whatever you say. But. <laughs> All right, but that's it. So, operator overload. And you know you can overload, you can load operators, you can load casting, which has conversion operator. You can overload index operator to give access to index of whatever you have. Uh, yeah, you can overload anything. <laughs> okay, it's, it's a, a and, but, but what is the meaning of overload? What, is, what does it mean to overload a function? No. What, how do, when you overload a function, what is needed? Same identifier. You are all answering the question perfectly, but not answering it properly. To overload something, it must exist first. Then you overload it. <laughs> You cannot overload a non-existing thing. That doesn't make sense. That's why operator overload only works if the operator exists. I cannot make the at sign an operator because it's not an operator. It doesn't exist. Got it? All right. And again, operator equal cannot be a helper. It has to be member. We're good with that? All right. So member operator is done. I'm just going through a quick thing. Class plus resources, we talked about it for five hours. Helper functions, I talked about it. Input and output, anybody have any problem? Go read input and output, see how you're going to format the things, right? Because we know operator overload, it's not like rocket science to, to, to see how we can print something with C out. So I can print an employee with C out. How do I do it? You so the standard way, let me just show you the standard way of the standard way of creating, so when I tell you 
Uh, let me just save this and get out. When I tell you to overload, when I ask you to overload the, the, fun, the, the, the class to be printed with C in or C out, with your eyes closed, you should do this, as I'm doing now. This is standard. OK? As soon as I tell you employee needs to get printed with C out, immediately you create a print function for it of kind. Print, write, whatever. That print returns O stream reference, print, receives O stream reference, OSTR, and initializes it to C STD C out, which means they can use print just by itself to print it out. If you don't provide this, OSDR will be a reference of C out and it's going to print it. In this, you print your employee however you want. Like you do all the things. If name, you print everything. And in here else, I'm going to say uh, OSDR uh, invalid employee. That's the safe empty state we were talking about, right? So in here, if I have the name, if the name is, it's M name, not name. I keep forgetting. Sorry, it's been a while since I programmed. So now I can say over here, OSDR, say name, na uh, OSDR, and I'm going to put M name. And of course, this is not going to compile because I didn't write the whole thing. You can complete it later on. And let's say I am going to have the ID of the employee printed. So it's M employee number, and in parentheses, I'm going to, uh, put the salary of the employee. For example, that's, let's say, is the format that I want to print the employee with. So M salary, and you can format that salary, give it to uh, whatever you are doing. And I'm not going to go to new line in here. And even in here, I'm not going to go to new line. It's a bad thing I did. OK, so I'm printing, and close the uh, parentheses like that. Now, now that it's done, I return OSDR. So that's step one. So if it was reading, it was I stream read, I stream ISDR is equal to C in, then you read. OK? So that's the same thing. Now, the next one is like three seconds. As soon as you do this, you simply say over here, O stream reference operator like that. At left side, you receive, uh, oh, um, um, by the way, because it's right, it's not supposed to change anything, so it has to be const. Remember, prints are always const, always const. Reads are not. At left side, I have O stream reference OSDR. At right side, I have constant employee reference E. And in here, all I need to do is to say return E.print. What happened? Uh, stupid compiler. OK. <laughs> Print, and I pass the OSDR to it. Done. So this is identical in all of them. Your print function may differ. That's how you do it. Done. For O stream, for I stream, you just change everything to I stream. That's reading. Now this can be printed using C out. Now I can actually come over here and print my employee saying, don't, this is not compilable, you know that, right? I can do that now because it is now printable. Because at left side I have C out, because I did not have access to O stream, I had to help create a helper function. You never make that a friend. You create a function for it. So the user have a choice to do this or write over here e.print. Or do this, OF stream file my file. Or they can print it in a file. They can say e.print in file, or you can say file. E and, and L. Doesn't make any difference. File is a child of C out. 
OF stream is a child of, o of C out. It knows everything C out. It can do it. Inheritance, remember that? So it works for all of them. So I wrote one function that works for both. That's the beauty of object, object orientation. OK? This program does not compile, OK? I, I didn't have time to write the whole thing, so this doesn't compile complete the code. I'm going to say, this does not compile as a practice. Complete the code, and you can um, offer it as contribution with a pull request. So what you can do, you can complete it, make it work, runs, and then make a pull request. I'll merge it to the repository so it will work. OK? Because it's read-only, you cannot push. You have to do a pull request, and I accept the pull request, and I merge it myself, if you want to. If you don't want to, fine. It doesn't matter. Just do it for yourself and try it and see how it works. Uh, it's 43. Why my alarm didn't go off? Today at 9.40 AM, it's 9.43, it didn't go. Hmm. Alarm means nothing. It says start. So I have to actually, stupid, OK. All right, didn't work. Oh, it actually created a timer for me. Anyway, so it's going bananas. Let me just delete it. Delete alarm. All right, so that's that. I'm going to pack up my stuff and run to the other one because it's like five minutes. I have to start in the other class. Uh, any questions, I'm going to answer while I'm uh, closing down stuff. Uh, all the presentations are going to be in the thing. I'm going to uh, submit it. I'm going to commit it in the other class. So it's not going to be there. What the devil? Please turn on the lights. Thank you. It comfortably went. <laughs> Don't come here now. No, it's not like I'm going to kick you or something. It's just I, I, I'm getting ready to get out. I mean, like, I cannot answer you. Give me two seconds. We are section NAA, correct? Yeah. You can come put your thing over here. Let me, I'm just going to, oh.